Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. My name is Sanchita Saxena. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for South Asia Studies. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Sonia Falero today. It's wonderful to have her here. She's an award-winning reporter and a writer of both fiction and nonfiction. Um, Sonia has reported for India Today and she's been a contributing editor to Vogue. She currently has a column in the New York Times. And her reporting um, really, she's produced a number of reports on various subjects, including um, India sex workers, um, Bombay bar dancers, a six part series on India's domestic workers, and extensive writings on the suicide of farmers, a wide variety of very important um, topics and social issues. She's the author of a book of fiction called The Girl um, and a contributor to numerous anthologies including AIDS Sutra, Untold Stories from India, that was published by Random House in 2008. Beautiful Thing, um, the book that she will be reading from today, is her first work of nonfiction, and it's based on five years of research in the secretive world of Bombay's dance bars. In a Times of India interview, Sonia was quoted as saying, Beautiful Thing isn't just nonfiction. It's nonfiction about a class of women who is marginalized and oppressed and it talks about the human condition of who we are as a people and the things we do to each other in the name of politics and morality in a manner that many people will be uncomfortable with. In fact, I was so sure no one would read Beautiful Thing that I took my time writing it. Well, in fact, people have been reading it and many, many people have been reading it and it's received um, you know, much acclaim and praise and m numerous awards. Um, it was Time Out Magazine Subcontinental Book of the Year in 2010, CNN, CNN's Mumbai Book of the Year, Economist 2011 um, Book of the Year, Guardian 2011 Book of the Year, and the Sunday Times 2011 Best Travel Book of the Year. So certainly people have been reading and it's re received great praise. So we're very happy to have Sonia here today. She will be um, talking a little bit about how she got interested in the project, a little bit about her research as well. It's, it's very um, interesting, her sort of the research process that she went through, as well as reading from the book. And then we will open it up to question and answer session um, towards the end. So welcome, Sonia. So hi everyone, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, I'm going to um, do a couple of short readings from the book, but before I start, I just want to give you some background about the kind of work that I do and how I got into uh, writing about the dance bars of Bombay. So um, I actually started off as a features reporter back in the day in Delhi, and at some point I moved to Bombay and joined an investigative news weekly. They still wanted me to write features. Um, but around 2003, 2004, there was a spate of uh, suicides in an agrarian district just outside Bombay. And farmers essentially were committing suicide because they could not repay their debts. And the debts were small, you know, $100 sometimes in some cases, small even for them um, in some ways. But we're talking about families that have generationally been as middle class as agrarian families can be, and the very fact that they were in debt and they were no longer able to support themselves and their family just led to a complete downward spiral. And you had these farmers uh, you know, hanging themselves or pouring pesticide down their throat. And the f suicides continued for several years. They never really received any attention in the mainstream media. But at some point, the rate of suicide went up to one every 12 hours. Mm -hmm. When that happened, Vidarbha, which is this district uh, outside Bombay, was suddenly inundated. When we speak of mainstream media in India, we mean the English-speaking media. So it was suddenly inundated, and everybody was talking about Vidarbha. And um, like I said, I was a reporter at the time. All my friends were reporters as well. And I remember starting a conversation with a couple of them about what was happening in Vidarbha. And the conversation essentially was, why is this happening? Why when the debts are fairly small and when there can be some you know, government or non-profit uh, organizational assistance, why are people still committing suicide? And what is happening was that, of course, the, suicide, the, the debts roll over. You know, so the debts don't end with the suicide of that particular person. Um, I found it really strange that we were all sitting around and we were all fairly informed people and yet none of us had a response to that question. Um, none of us had a sense of engagement with what was happening in Vidharba, which had it happened in 
anywhere else had happened in the States, for example, would have really been on the front pages and we would have all known exactly you know, sort of the whys and the wherefores of it. Um, so it was really stunning for me that we did not have a sense of, I think, uh, engagement, uh, any sort of attachment or feeling for what was happening. And I wanted to figure out why. I wanted to figure out why we were failing, essentially, as reporters and as citizens um, to understand uh, and to find attachment with the subject. So what I did was uh, put aside whatever feature story I was writing. I think I was, I'm pretty sure I was doing a profile of, of an actor. Um, and I asked permission from my editor if, to go to Vidarbha. And Vidarbha is just a couple of hours away from Bombay. It's a plane ride away. Um, I was told no, because that wasn't my beat. So uh, I bided my time, and two months later, uh, you know, by no contribution of mine, that editor was fired. And so the man who was his replacement was the person I approached again as though the idea had just struck me. And he said, oh, well, why not? And so I went to Vidarbha. And Vidarbha is, you know, as it, it's a, just a series of villages. And there were these homes where you had only women looking after their children and no support at all. And these were women who had never worked in the fields. They had been housewives all their lives. But because the debt that their husbands had taken had rolled over to them, they had to work. So these people, women who didn't only knew how to cook and clean, who were completely illiterate, suddenly found themselves in the field, plowing the field, or sowing the seeds, or growing crops, essentially. Because they couldn't do it alone, they took out their kids from school, and so you had, you would drive through these huge tracts of land and only see women and young children working on the field. Um, this was a story that had never been spoken about uh, because people concentrated on the fact that all these men were committing suicide. Uh, nobody spoke of the fact that the women were left over to absorb their debt. Um, another thing that we never spoke of was the fact that the government decided to give these farmers, uh, the, uh, the families of these farmers compensation because of the suicides, because they felt a sense of responsibility. Uh, but once that compensation arrived to the family, the woman, the wife, and her children, with the exception of the male, the males, the sons, was thrown out of the house so that the in-laws would absorb the compensation and leave this woman and she would be out on the street. So these are just two examples of the stories that were never told when all of us were talking about Vidharpa. <coughs> and um, when I found out about these stories and I started writing about them, I felt that uh, you know one of the reasons that a lot of the writing that we do in India and, and perhaps elsewhere as well uh, about marginalized communities and about subcultures, um, a lot of the re reason why it doesn't resonate is that because we never talk about the human element, we never talk about the people, and we talk in terms of numbers and places and professions. And uh, you know, it's, it's hard to engage with those sort of things, particularly so in a country like India, where we are all about the numbers. Everything for a country of one billion people is a very large number. And when you're dealing with large numbers, after a while, you know, it, it really means nothing. I mean, 50 people, 100 people, what does that mean in a country of one billion? It's not even a blip. And so that was when I decided that you know, this is the sort of writing that I wanted to do. I wanted to write about people on the margins. And when I told their stories, irrespective of what the stories were, I would tell their stories through these very, what I thought were very intimate, detailed, personal accounts of people's lives, because that is how I think people connect. Um, so about a year later, in 2005, um, I write a story about a bar dancer in Bombay. Now, for those of you who haven't been to Bombay, aren't familiar with the concept of dance bars, they're essentially these seedy little bars. You used to have them in all the neighborhoods. And they're tiny bars. They smell of alcohol. They smell of meats. They, they're very, very loud. And there's a small uh, stage in the middle. And there are these women. Like, they can be as many as 20, 25 women. Sometimes there isn't even room to move. Dancing vigorously and with apparently great enthusiasm, all faked, I assure you, to Bollywood music. Mm -hmm. And so the men sit at a particular distance and to show them, they, they're just agog, okay? Um, there's n you can do nothing else because the music is so loud, you can literally just sit and stare. To show their appreciation, the men shower these women with money. Uh, which makes it sound a little more extravagant than it is because, you know, sometimes it's a five rupee note or a ten rupee note. 
but they throw money on these women. And sometimes they'd even put a garland of 100 or 500 rupee notes on the woman, and they're not allowed to touch these women, so the garland is given to the waiter. And so basically women dancing under a shower of money while men eat kebabs, drink very overpriced beer, and stare at them. This was entertainment for a very large group of, of Bombay's men. Um, that's all that ever happened in the dance bar. You know, sure, there were dance bars that were also brothels, but that's what we call a brothel, not a dance bar. But in these dance bars, of which there were about 1,500 in Bombay, um, this sort of entertainment was, there was that this was all there was to it. And sometime in 2005, after I, wrote, I met a young bar dancer called Leela, and I wrote a story about her, and she was incredibly fascinating to me. She was 19 years old. She swore like a sailor. She flirted with everybody she knew. She behaved like she had the best life in the world, that all she did was dance and shop and, and go to restaurants um, to eat tandoori chicken. And it was fascinating to me that she could create this version of her life, or rather she, could, uh, she would offer this particular version of her life, when although I knew very little about bar dancers, I knew that if you were a bar dancer in Bombay, you had had a very difficult life. Um, the majority of bar dancers, as I later discovered, for example, had been the victims of incest or of other forms of sexual assault. They had been pimped out by family members. They had prostituted themselves on the road. They had been beaten. So to meet this girl, to meet Leela, and to make it look like you know she was living the best life one could hope for, and to know at the same time that that, that couldn't possibly be right, made, made her behavior, made her attitude just incredibly poignant um, and was something that I wanted to learn more about. So I started following Leela and um, she humored me and the idea initially was that I would write this long newspaper piece on her. But just a few months after we met, um, the government of Maharashtra, the state of which Bombay is the capital, came to this sudden and incredibly strange decision that they should ban dance bars. Um, they came to the uh, realization of some sort that dance bars were connected to immorality and crime. So basically, by dancing in a bar, a woman was causing men to be immoral and pushing them towards criminal acts. So nobody really knew whether this was a joke that they were playing on us or whether they were actually going to ban dance bars and put 70, 80,000 girls out of work on this premise. Uh, but they were. They were, they were absolutely um, uh, serious. And within two months of this proclamation, dance bars were shut. And about 75,000 or 80,000 girls, some as young as 16, uh, some in their 30s, were thrown out of work. And they had nowhere to go. And the dance bars, of course, continued, except that they were no, there was no dancing permitted. But they continued, and some of them, you know, converted into yoga centers or banks or uh, other various assorted, uh, assorted places. But essentially, if you were a man working in the dance bar, so if you wanted a dancer, you still had a job. Your life still pretty much continued the way that it was. But if you were a woman in a dance bar, all that meant was all you did was dance and you no longer had a job. And, you know, people lose jobs and, and shit happens, as we say. Um, but the fact was that these dance, these bar dancers, um, and this is something that the government knew, were all incredibly vulnerable for the fact that they were very low caste. Uh, some of them were in traditional professions in which girls are pushed into sex work, and so therefore the fact that they were not pushed into sex work but were into the dance bar instead was a huge leg up for them because they did not have to sleep with men for money if they didn't want to. So they were low caste. Um, they, it, it was caste that had pushed many of them into this profession. The majority were illiterate. They had various addictions as a result of the profession that they'd been pushed into. So, you know, they were cutters, alcoholics, so on and so forth. And um, so when these girls were pushed out of their jobs, uh, one of the big questions everybody asked was, you know, what do you think they're going to do now? And that always struck me as, as really stunning that a reporter would ask, what are they going to do now? Because the obvious question is, well, when you don't have any money because you don't know how to save, uh, and the reason you don't know how to save is because you can't read and write and you have no proof that you exist, 
and you've been literally pushed out in the street, what do you think you're going to do? Um, of course, the majority of these girls ended up entering the sex industry. And the sex industry in Bombay is incredibly complex, incredibly hierarchical, and a place of great violence. And for many young women, particularly, it's a place where you have a very short lifespan, you know, in professional terms and literal terms. Um, so the impact on the bar dancers, and particularly Leela, the young girl that I happened to know at that time, was just was, was immediate and it was staggering. And so I wanted to write about it uh, because I felt that in terms of the violence meted out to women in India, uh, it's, it's something that we do often and we do it without thinking twice. And I knew that within a few months, once the excitement died down, we'd forget about the dance bars. And actually we have. Um, I wanted to make sure that, to the best of my ability at least, we wouldn't, that we would later on, for as long as we could, think about what we'd done and try to make sure that we didn't do it again. And so I wrote Beautiful Thing, which is a story of Leela um, before and after the band. And it's a story of her family and her friends and her customers who she loathed because she couldn't figure out how anybody could be so stupid as to pay money uh, just to watch somebody dance. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is just get you a little bit into the book by reading a couple of excerpts. The first one is from when Leela arrives in Bombay. So she's uh, actually up from up in North India. She lives in a cantonment with her parents. And her father, at some point, thinks it's a good idea to prostitute her to the local cops because he thinks, you know what, I don't want to work, but hey, I have this teenage daughter. I can put her to work. Uh, and what easier job than sex work. So he sends her off to the cops. And at some point, Leela, you know, comes back home. She's been to school and she, then she goes to the cops and she comes back home and she says, you know what, I'm a prostitute. As, you know, that's never gonna change. But I would rather be a prostitute and make my own money for myself than be a prostitute and pay for my father. So she decides that the best way out of the situation she's in is to catch the first train out of uh, Meerut, which is a city where she's living in, the small town, and go off to Bombay, where she's heard there are these amazing things called dance bars, where women can essentially just dance and get paid. And uh, when they're not dancing, they can, you know, watch films and go shopping. And it all sounds like a very exciting life. So she decides to go for it. Someone warned Leela, Mira Road Station. And so she knew where to get off, even though what she knew, she momentarily forgot when she saw before her Bombay. So big, she gasped with wonder, descending onto the platform with her shabby little suitcase. Too, too big. Unsure of what to do, Leela did nothing, and that was a misstep she was not likely to forget. She was elbowed and shoved, and her breasts squeezed like oranges for juice by half a dozen hands. She would have fallen off the platform and onto the tracks if she hadn't grabbed on to a coolie hurrying past. Bombay was crowded, Leela concluded, as she dusted her salvar kameez off with what was to become her trademark equanimity. And it wasn't anything like a Bollywood film, she admitted to herself with a sigh. She took another look, to be double sure. Where were the white mountains, the shiny red gharis, the yellow head firangs? Which way was Marine Drive? Where did Amitabh Bachchan live? And was it true? This was a city where women drank side by side with men, and men wore shoes crafted from the skin of cows fattened on London's greenest grass? Acha, where was London? What do they wear there? And yes, Bombay smelt. Not in the manner of the Meerut cantonment with its profusion of giant flowering neem trees, their branches shooting out like the fingers of a ravenous witch. Back home, when a woman stepped out of her house and into the courtyard to dry her freshly washed hair, the breeze carried with it the scent of Chandrika soap and Amla Shikakai. And when a father was clever enough to marry his daughter off well, then the air scooped into its arms the aroma of the finest vegetarian delicacies and of garlands of marigolds and gajras of jasmine. Not like that at all. Bombay smelt of shit. And everywhere she looked, from the train tracks where people were strolling like they were in a park, even laying clothes out to dry, to the hillock that sloped into the opposite side of the tracks between the neatly plotted lines of the spinach and potatoes someone enterprising was growing, all Leela saw was shit. How her eyes smarted, 
and that tutti smell, combined with all the other station smells of sugarcane juice and vada pao, fresh fruit and flowers, fish spiced and fried, and the hot fragrance of milk being poured into a giant utensil of freshly brewed masala tea made her giddy. In the midst of these thoughts, Leela was accosted by a woman who inquired in a kindly tone if she was lost, and on hearing her story, commiserated. Let me walk with you, Betty, she said. Of course I know where Night Lovers is, so famous it is. Only ten minutes away. No, no, no. Don't argue. You are like my daughter only. But despite the woman's familiar appearance, her coin-sized gold hoops, the umbrella sticking out of her shiny pleather bag, she was, as Leela would soon discover, a brothel madam who pumped her business with runaways from the Chilla Room, children's homes run by the government's child welfare wing. She took Leela to her brothel. It was crowded, filthy, and shrill with the sound of a baby's cries. Under threat of scarring Leela's face with acid, she said she stored in a baby feeder, the madam forced Leela to have sex with several customers. Four days later, striped with bruises, Leela jumped out of a window and escaped. Leela was not surprised by what had happened to her. She was relieved. Had that bitch not got me, a policeman would have, she said, and he would have stuck me in the chiller room in Mankurt. Do you know what they say about that place? That it's a brothel for Bombay's politicians. The police act as pimps. Why? Because they want money. They round up orphans and runaway girls and then call the Mantri Lok. Please, Sarji, Savji, come now, pick and choose. The Mantri Lok fucked the little girls and afterwards tipped the manageress. Thank you so much, madam. They are men, and that's what men do. But she's a harami danger look. She's supposed to be a mother to the girls, but during the day she makes them weave baskets, and at night she cracks apart their thighs with a lati. What luck I got saved. It wasn't mere luck, it was written, and that's why Leela was unperturbed by the startling welcome Bombay had given her. It was the start of a new life, as Jyotishji had described it when he read her palm just before she fled Mirat. Even though it was understood he was meant to lie and prophesy only a peaceful marriage and a fertile womb, he couldn't help himself. Cut him, he had mumbled through a mouthful of pan, juice slip sliding out as he spoke. It will always be cut him. Leela had smiled at Jyotishji, even tipped him an ache saw. At 13, she had the self-awareness to see and to accept the truth. And the truth was this. She was no virgin. Not even in the way some girls had sex with their first couple of boyfriends and when dissatisfied with the results, shrugged off the young men as mistakes and pronounced themselves pure. She didn't come from a good family. Her father didn't even have the upbringing to beat her mother behind closed doors. And that too only after he'd gagged her mouth with his hand. Even his daughter's business he couldn't keep quiet about. Wasn't it true everyone in the cantonment knew how Singh had upgraded to a 26-inch TV? Fucker. And the truth was that although she wanted to better herself, she wouldn't always be up to the task. She was just a girl, no match for destiny. In any case, she knew this too. You didn't fight destiny like destiny was your mother and you would win. Destiny, Leela knew, like she thought she knew who she was, was an unbreakable promise, an infallible prayer. She embraced it. Leela had worked at Night Lovers ever since and she never did return home. She warned her mother, if you give my father a pesa of the money I've earned, I will come to Meerut and pray, pry out every one of your teeth. Even Apsara, who many in the cantonment believe was mentally challenged, could understand that her daughter might harbor ill feelings towards her husband. She took Leela's threat seriously, and until the time she could cash them in, hid her daughter's money orders in her underwear. Manohar, Leela's father, thought Leela's whereabouts were unknown to his family. He tried to find a missing persons report with the police, but they were after all the same men he had rented Leela out to. Believing he was temporarily hiding his daughter as a way to increase their lust and extract more money, they paid him no heed. Your little whore did not go to school alone, one of them informed him. So this is um, from the second part of the book. Um, so in the first part, we get to know Leela, her family, her friends, the fact that, you know, her life is uh, on the way up. She's having um, an affair with her boss, a man called Pushotam Shetty. And Pushotam Shetty has plenty of other girlfriends. And of, 
as a matter of fact, has a wife and a few children. But that doesn't deter Leela, who feels that, you know what, she's anyway never going to have a legal marriage, but at least she can be Purushottam Shetty's number one dance bar wife. And so uh, towards the end of part one, Purushottam Shetty finally does what Leela never thought he would do, which is to take her on a little um, weekend break. So they go to this hill station called Lonavla, which is just outside Bombay. And initially, Leela is peeved because, you know, he's sitting there, he's got cable, he's watching porn and drinking beer when there's clearly a swimming pool outside and there's a buffet and there's lassi to drink and there's so many things they can do. But finally, after, you know, struggling with, with sort of the sense that maybe he doesn't really want to be with her, he succumbs to her charms and uh, she re feels that, well, this is it. We are definitely going to get married. Um, but very, very shortly after, the government decides that you know a ban is necessary if they have to curb the immorality and crime that Bombay is apparently rampant with. And so they decide to shut the dance bars. And without warning, um, Leela is completely bereft. Um, one of the ways that she tries to sort of get a handle on her life is by walking or attempting to walk on what she thinks is the straight and narrow. So she goes with a friend of hers who's a hijra, a transgender, an Indian transgender. She goes with her to this spiritual site called Haji Malang, which is a few hours outside Bombay. And Haji Malang is very, very uh, important to the hijras. They feel an affinity uh, for the place, and they go there religiously every year. Um, the only thing is that once they go there, there's a little less prayer and a little more getting to know one another in, in, you know, in the most obvious sense. So as night descends, everybody gets drunk, either, uh, you know, everybody's having sex in various corners. Uh, Leela and I are locked up in the room that we'd rented because uh, Leela's friend is afraid that something terrible is going to happen to us. And uh, so we go to bed, and when we wake up, suddenly in the middle of the night, because it seems to be a sort of kerfuffle going on in the same bed that we are in, um, we realize that there are two people in the bed. Uh, one of them is Leela's friend, the Hijra, Masti, and the other one happens to be Leela's ex-boyfriend. Uh, so Leela is, of course, furious, and we have to stay there whole night listening you know, to the activities. And finally, as, as Dawn, Dawn, Dawn makes its appearance, uh, it's deemed safe for us, for us to leave, so we finally get out of our little room, and Leela is absolutely seething, and she decides that actually, you know, she, even friends can't be trusted, nobody can be trusted. Um, in any case, we're sitting around in the courtyard uh, having breakfast when Masti, who is Leela's friend, and Leela's ex-boyfriend uh, decide to join us. Later that morning, Masti and Abid Khan joined us in the courtyard for a breakfast of tea, pakoras, and jalebis. Masti introduced her new friend to us. Abid Khan was very tall and thin and wore tight black jeans. He was shirtless but compensated for this with a collection of accessories including earrings, silver rings and a watch that hung limply off his right wrist. He had curly black hair that smelt of jasmine and he, he wore coal in his eyes. Leela ji, he said warmly. Leela responded with a grim smile. Nothing but Musti's manner suggested that she knew she had upset Leela. On the contrary, dressed only in boxer shorts, her chest and face bare, Musti was radiant. There was a lightness to her I hadn't seen before, and Abid Khan must have agreed, for he was as eager to snuggle up to her as he had been the previous night. Abid Khan leaned forward. I'm a researcher, he tells me. I'm researching sex practices. Is that a full-time job? I inquired. <laughs> <laughs> job? What job? muttered Leela. His job is do number ka kaam, smuggling. Mm. Abid Khan ignored her. I sell watermelons, he said with a straight face. Watermelons and watches. You sell watermelons and watches. That's an interesting combination, I said. He has his own truck, explained Musti, animated. Say the police ask him to open his backside. What will they find? Watermelons, juicy, juicy. But if they throw aside the watermelons, then what will they find? Watches foreign watches, from China and Korea, Taiwan and Sri Lanka, you name it, the world's finest watches. When he was not working, the Betty smuggling line, driving his truck across Bombay, selling watches he claimed were of solid gold and pure diamonds, Abid Khan pursued his research. He had so far conducted experiments in rose, nose, black, back, French, Italian, female and male, 
hijra and three person sex. Very impressive, I said. Masti sat back pleased. So did Leela until she got Masti's look of pride. Then her smile collapsed into sourness and she got up and walked away. So, do you visit dance bars? I asked, watching Leela's retreating back. Abid Khan sat up. Barwalis are devil women, I tell you, he said vigorously. It's true what they say. Ladies bar jayega, but baad ho jayega. If you visit a ladies bar, you will be ruined. How so? Are you go there for some fun. Am I right? You have drinks, you become high. You become high, you become horony. Horony? Yes, wanting sex. Don't you know horony? Yes? <laughs> Are what horony, horony? Grumbled Musty. Leave her alone. Are you yourself horony, the way you are looking at her? No, sweetie, nothing like that. I'm just explaining. See, you become high, you become horony. Am I right? You become horony, you want sex. You want sex, you need a girl. <coughs> but these bar dancers, oh, let me tell you, they are not of flesh and blood. They are entirely of nakra. In a certain kind of bar, one of them will sit next to you and she will say, hey, handsome, can I use your cell? Or, hey, sweetie, how are you? And naturals, you get excited. But the moment you say, hello, beautiful, do you want to come to a hotel with me? She will start to make all sorts of sounds and noises, like she's a movie star and you're asking for an autograph in the middle of her eating time. And her starting rate is so high and Ambani only can fuck her. <laughs> How much would a girl like that ask for? Any amount that enters her head. Sometimes 4,000 rupees, sometimes five. And that doesn't include the fee for the lodge and all the food she'll make you buy her, like she's a half-starved goat. And not only is she overpriced, she's much too sharp. Sharp as a drawer full of knives. What of the dancer who took full control of her husband's bar? What of her? I said. She became boss. He became sweeper. Sweeper in her <coughs> dance bar. He inched forward. Okay, can I be Franks? Musty nodded on my behalf. Ha ha, bolo bolo. She's my sister. You speak openly. So the other day I get a call from this pimp. A real dirty guy. Come see my new mall, he says. I said, fine. I picked up some whiskey. Why should I lie? His flat in Mira Road was filthy, and inside, sprawled naked on the bed, was a girl of no more than 12 or 13. She was Marielle, like she'd been starved. No coast on her bones. I couldn't even look at her. She looked so pathetic. I took out my wallet and threw 200 rupees on her. Then I walked out. So what will this girl do? Sex work. Then the dance bar when she's about 15, 16. Then Dubai to dance for gangsters and sheiks, to fuck them, get HIV. That's how it goes. At the end of her short career, what is left of such a girl? Even if you wanted to love her, she wouldn't let you. Even if you offered her the world, car, clothes, cable, TV, she wouldn't stay with you. She's no more human, she's a ghost. I tell you, sometimes I feel sorry for these girls. But then one of them plays me for a fool and I realize, gai bhaes paani mein. The buffalo has gone into the water. There's nothing I can do for her. She's a hopeless case. Thank you. So I wouldn't go into any details uh, just because I wouldn't want to um, spoil it for anybody who hasn't read the book. Um, you know, I, I know of the whereabouts of some of the people in the book. Let's just put it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it was, I, how can you not, there's never any sense of really reassurance. Um, you know, if even one of the things that happened to Leela or, or her family or friends happened to uh, happened to me. I, I would not be able to get out of my bed ever. And to think that you know a, the lives of a lot of people, uh, particularly I think young women um, who are born poor, who are you know born of low caste, who don't really have the support of 
not only their family but also the community at large the fact the things that they have to go to go through repeatedly um, to expect them to surmount all of that to expect them not to succumb is really to expect something superhuman from them um, but it, it does happen I mean mm -hmm. if, if people do surmount the circumstances it's, it's <coughs> extraordinary I think that in so many ways doing this sort of writing doing this sort of reportage really is it's really about you know what you can learn it's as much about telling somebody's story as about trying to really learn how they live um, it's trying to sort of just understand the mechanics of survival the, the method of which you're doing I mean you're, are you recording these conversations or uh, taking notes on them I mean, for example if you give you, you quote the interchange between Manohar and the cops in Meerut I mean obviously you weren't there at mm. that time so you're just reimagining that or getting it from some other source or? yeah you know <coughs> it, um, so it's it's a lot of recording it's a lot of writing it's um, corroborating with as many people as I can um, I mean, the fact is that I, I, I don't imagine that you could ever really write a book where you'd be there for every mm -hmm. incident, um, be able to, um, you know, shadow every conversation. Mm -hmm. That's almost a, a pity, but that there's just no way around that. And I think the best that you can do is, in, as a reporter, is just try and be as, um, try and sort of secure what's happening the best that you can by asking as many people, um, perhaps visiting places yourself. Um, mm -hmm. People do have different memories, obviously, mm -hmm. of, of the same experience, of the same event. But talking to as many people as you can definitely does help. Yeah. Are you living in Bombay now? I actually split my time. So it's, um, I go to India every, every two months. So I'm here for about a month. I live in San Francisco now, and then I go back for a month, maybe two months. Because yeah. I'm wondering, how have you been received having exposed so much that I assume was not known broadly? Yeah. What has been the reaction to your writing? Um, I think it was really, um, really surprising to me how that the book did very well in India. Um, it was surprising because I, I don't think people think that these subjects or a certain kind of person is relevant. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think somebody's relevant, you never really find them interesting. Mm -hmm. But I really do think that we are at the stage where we actually um, sort of setting the blinkers aside and find people who are different from us, th and I'm talking specifically about India, mm -hmm. to be of, at the very least, great interest. I mean, we may still not be concerned. We may mm -hmm. still be very happy with the status quo, mm -hmm. the, the divisions of class and caste mm -hmm. that are so convenient mm -hmm. to most of us. Uh, perhaps we're still satisfied with those, mm -hmm. but we are definitely more interested than we ever were before. I can't imagine a book like this being of any interest 10 years ago. Um, the one interesting thing that did happen was that you know the ban was overturned by the High Court in Maharashtra. Um, not not good news, uh, really, because it was con this was in 2006 or so. It was immediately contested by the state government, and then it went on. So the ban stayed. It went on to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has just been sitting on this ever since. But a few months <coughs> after the book came out, there was the Supreme Court did uh, release a statement talking about the fact that you know there should why asking why the government didn't make alternate arrangements to employ these young women. Um, one of the very bright ideas that the government uh, initially suggested was that they would be employed as, as some sort of guards or security people. <laughs> and it was just so strange. And, you know, even... And then is, let's say that they had actually been employed uh, in, in that form. I mean, that would have... You know, it's at least employment. It's absurd, but at least it's a paycheck. Um, but, of course, none of that... Uh, none of that happened but you know even it, it's a very very difficult situation because with even with somebody like Leela I have this conversation with Leela where I say look I mean you're unemployed you have no money you, because you've never saved all the money she has she puts at the bottom of you know this jar of flour or hides under her bed or wherever it's easily accessible and so she doesn't have any money and I say to her well I I know a non-profit and I think they can hire you as a field worker mm -hmm. and you'll get you know the what would be the equivalent of maybe $70 a month mm -hmm. um, and she just said, no, 
because you know what? I was earning 10 times that much. Why would I waste my time uh, to suggest that I w it was demeaning to her to do that sort of work? Um, but this is really about, you know, you have to change people's mindsets. You have to work mm -hmm. with them. You can't wrench somebody out of their job, out of their life, and then ex expect them to be grateful for whatever crumbs you throw in their direction. I mean, you were just saying that she didn't have, you know, she didn't save her money, she just put it in a jar, but most of these people can't even get bank accounts, is my understanding, yeah. because they don't have the IDs I to get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, that, that's another really serious, you know, just not even accepted in, in the basic, you know, level of the most level of civilization, in a sense, the government doesn't recognize their existence. Yeah. Those. So they're essentially in that, you know, an in, invisible population mm -hmm. because they don't have absolutely um, any paperwork, you know, starting from the birth certificate. Because, of course, a lot of them also, you know, especially if you come from the village or let's say you, you are what we call the poorest of the poor, the hardcore poor, you live in an urban area, but you live in a, on a pavement, you will have a dai, mm -hmm. uh, a, a woman who has been doing this generationally, it's a generational profession, coming to your apartment uh, and delivering your child for you. And that's... That's about as official as it's going to get. Um, one of the interesting things that the, a nonprofit that I know of in Bombay is doing right now is they're trying to get um, families that live on the pavement to send their kids to school. And school, of course, now in India is free. So there is, you know, that the excuse of, well, I can't afford school no longer stands. Um, but because those families themselves are illiterate, they don't really, it, it's hard for them to conceptualize the value, the point of education, especially since the, the returns aren't immediate. You know, you have to invest 15 years and then five more perhaps. So because the returns aren't immediate and they don't have the experience, they don't know why they should avail of this free, um, uh, you know, this option. So one of the things that the nonprofit does is says, if you send your kid to school, we will get all your paperwork for you. Mm -hmm. So we will get you a birth certificate or a residency certificate. And once you get that paperwork, then you, you exist. And once you exist, you are a very, very poor person who exists, and therefore you get a lot of government benefits. You know, you get a ration card, and of course you'll get your voter's ID card. But it's, you know, that, that sort of transaction actually works. But, um, but yeah, to start off, a lot of people don't even have that, and certainly Leela didn't. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Leela and how it may have changed you know, through the project? I mean, you said it's over five years you were mm. working with her. I mean, initially, I assume, you know, you mentioned that she was a little bit, um, you know, not very interested maybe, or, you know, she, she thought you were writing a smaller article, but how did it change as you were working with her um, and then you were, you were saying that you were going to write a longer piece? How did her relationship with you change and her kind of attitude about the project? Well, actually, so I, I had seen, I was already writing about, you know, interesting subcultures in uh, Bombay. I did a lot of writing on the hijras, for example. Um, I didn't really know anything about dance bars, but I happened to see a news report about dance bars. And so I asked uh, somebody that I knew who was in the bar business, he actually owned a dance bar, whether he'd introduced me to some women. And he said, it's useless, they won't talk to you, but you know, I owe you a favor, so come along to my dance bar. And what he did was send all his bar dancers home, and he called up three or four other girls who worked in really distant parts of the city, nowhere close to where he was. He called them over, and he had them waiting for me. And so I enter this dance bar. It's during the day, but they have the music on, and the disco ball is spinning, and th these girls are sitting at the corner. And the loudest, you know, um, the most vivacious is Leela. And so she's somebody that I was immediately drawn to because, as I said, I understood what the life of a bar dancer was. And it just seemed to me uh, just really sort of difficult to digest that she was still so comfortable with, with who she was and, and happy and optimistic. And um, so I decided I would do a long piece on her, a profile of, of a bar dancer's life. So I called her up after that, and you know she wasn't really interested, and she wouldn't take my calls. But I think because I was persistent, and at some point we would we could actually have a conversation about what I wanted to achieve, mm -hmm. um, which was to talk about this life on the margins, a life that was that many in the mainstream perceived of as being glamorous and of easy money, and essentially being the life of a sex worker. Um, I, I wanted to portray that for what it really was. And once she understood that, she was very kind. Um, 
with her time and allowed me to just hang around. And because she honored me with her trust, so did the people around her. Mm -hmm. But of course, without her, I mean, I can't even imagine walking into a dance bar in sort of in the middle of the night and just standing there like, you know, like a chump with my record. I mean, yeah. but have get kicked out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so what was her response to the product of the book and the success of the book that kind of made her a national figure in a way? Is she aware of that? Um, you know, all I can say is that she's read parts of it, but we're talking about years ago. Um, again, I can't tell you anything more because a lot of that leads to the end of the book. But I think she would be very, I think she'd be pleased. Uh, how, how long did you stay with her at uh, what the people around her? I mean, their, their attitudes towards you. Uh, what, what, what was your uh, most uh, challenging or critical time during your interview? I think, uh, you know, there's a scene in the book that I write about where I go to a, um, where uh, Leela, early on, decides, uh, you know, I've been tailing Leela best I can, which is very difficult because, you know, she's always going somewhere and, and Bombay is just very far flung. It takes forever to get from one place to the other. It would take me about two hours to get to her house. So I couldn't really, if she just took, call, called me and said, I'm leaving in 10 minutes, you know, I wouldn't make it there. But at some point she decided perhaps to test my commitment to the project and she calls me up and she said, you know, I'm going for a birthday party, you can come if you like. And I was really excited because, you know, I felt like, okay, this is taking our relationship to the next level. Um, obviously, what she did not tell me until I had literally stepped out of the house was that the birthday party was in a red light area and it was a brothel madam, a hijra brothel madam, mm -hmm. and the party would start at 11.30 at night. Mm -hmm. And so I go there and just, it just seemed so right, so appropriate that the moment I reach, all I see is Leela getting into a fight with the cop surrounded by hijras, you know, egging each other on, threatening him. And, um, you know, again, it was, they were all, it was it's this brothel, it's just so painfully raw. You know, the, the building, for example, was three stories high. It had exactly two windows for the entire, for three stories. And inside there was no furniture. So even the sex work was carried out on the floor. And um, it was just the most, the most tragic place. And yet everybody was dressed up to the nines. They were dressed like they were going for a wedding. And there was loud music blaring. And, uh, you know, beer and food. And everybody seemed very happy. But at some point, someone put on a, a very sad song, a very famous um, Bollywood song, film song. And we were all sitting down. And I remember looking around. And everybody around me was crying. And they weren't saying anything. They were just crying. And I think in that moment, you know, it really struck me that this, there's just no way, I think, in one, uh, on one hand to capture that, to capture the tragedy um, of people's lives, you know, and a lot of that tragedy has nothing to do with anything that they've done. Um, it's really about just being born, you know, to the wrong family, um, in the wrong place. It could happen to any one of us. And, uh, and I think that that was, when I went back, maybe three or four in the morning, I really had that sense that this would be something that I probably would not be able to do. And I thought very seriously about whether I could continue, but it, was, it just seemed like a series of incidents like this. And yet at the same time, you know, there was no way to, I mean, Leela is not, was never a tragic figure herself. She was incredibly sort of optimistic and brave and uh, very inspiring. And I think she deserved to be written about. She didn't deserve to be told, you know what, actually, this is not my cup of tea. You know? you're, you're too, your life is too hard for me to write about. It's OK for you to live, but uh, the writing I'm going to skip. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, Leela, you mentioned that you Like are 
kind of coerced into sleeping with their like I guess their their butler clients and that sort of thing. So that I noticed there was like a tension between them. What do you think? Do you think they would was the dance floor maybe a, a leg up for them or like a source of empowerment or were they also like kind of a source of entrapment for the women? You know. Um I mean, there are a couple of things. One is that, in my experience, the majority of the women that I met and interviewed did not sleep with men, uh, did not have to sleep with men on a daily basis to survive. Mm -hmm. The money they made from the dance bar was enough to support them and their families. Um, you know, sometimes when money was running low, they would sleep with somebody, one of their customers. Uh, more common was that they would have these longer-term relationships with customers, where there was, you know, in exchange, there was, in exchange for sex, they got, um, they got money, but they also got stuff, things, for their house, for their family, and I think they they got the this a sense of security for you know, in, in the best sort of the, the sort of security, the best security they could hope for in that environment. They had a committed customer who would take them out a couple of times a week, take them places. Um, so in, in, and if you compare that with the lives of, you know, at the very bottom, the floating sex workers who don't have pimps and who regularly get beaten um, or, you know, have, have a lot of violence inflicted on them, or girls in brothels, girls or hijras in brothels, who cannot leave. And once they are allowed to leave, uh, they don't know where to go. They have nowhere to go because they've been rejected universally. And all of these people, whether they're you know floating sex workers or, or brothel girls or call girls, they all do it because they need that money every single day. Uh, Bar dancer didn't need that money. The f the primary support she received was not from a customer. It was from the dance bar. Um, also, I, I did not see, you know, this, the sort of, the manner in which young women are trafficked into um, brothels uh, was not something that was ever visible to me, uh, was not a story I heard ever in relation to the dance bars. There was no trafficking. There were certainly women who were pushed into it because their parents couldn't or wouldn't work or because they had close relatives who were bar dancers, or because their, you know, uh, their mother worked in a dance bar. So there was certainly that situation where, it was made, where they were made to understand that it's the best thing for them and for their family. But the sort of coercion, the entrapment, uh, the abuse that you see with victims of trafficking in the sex industry is not visible in the dance bar. So yeah, I mean, the thing is that everything is relative. I mean, would I, you know, recommend that anybody becomes a bar dancer? No. Uh, but given the circumstances, was it something that they were proud of? Was it certainly an achievement for them? Uh, could they support themselves, put their, uh, you know, nephews and nieces through school, buy a house, keep themselves safe, insist, demand that their customers use protection because they had the option of saying no if they didn't? Yeah, all of those things. What is the economics of it? I mean, since you bring it up, is all right. So they go, they dance. People throw malas and rupees at them. Mm -hmm. But now they get, they keep what's given to them. They have to pay the bar owner. How, how does that work? And, I mean, in, in the prostitution business, of course, most of the money goes to the brothel owner, yeah. the pimp, and so on. Like the women get that relatively little. But here you're saying they're obviously able to support themselves and their families on their earnings. So yeah. I mean, what would a typical good bar dancer be able to earn? So um, they get seventy. They used to get about seventy percent of what was thrown on them. Mm. Of course, the thing to remember is that the money is actually thrown on them, and then it's collected and put into their, these little lockers. Mm. You know, and they get to open the lockers and take out the money at the end of the evening. So, how much of the money that's collected actually goes into their lockers is, you know, mm. a matter of discussion. But they get seventy percent of whatever they appear to earn, and. Um, Sorry, what was... No, I'm just saying how much they would then... Yeah, the so then, so how much would they earn? You know, it, again, it really depends. I would say, <coughs> I mean, Leela, for example, let me just give you the example of Leela, could earn maybe every, anything from 100 to two, three hundred dollars a night, which is a huge amount of money, of course. Yeah. And when the ban took place and dancing was forbidden, uh, for a short time, some dance bars tried out this fascinating experiment of having the girls in the bar 
by not having them dance. Mm -hmm. So they stood in the dance bar. Mm -hmm. So you would enter this dance bar and you would see these customers sitting baffled and you would see these, all these girls standing around like statues, equally baffled, and they just stared at each other. And the music continued, and there was this staring competition going on. And, you know, you, what, what do you expect? I mean, how much money do you think they got for standing and staring? I mean, if they were lucky if they made, you know, uh, like a couple of dollars, maybe. You know. But that experiment did not last long. That, that was actually depressing for everybody <laughs> involved. Thank you very much. Sir.